Go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. Keep in your prayers the people that have experienced loss and the things that went with the hurricane in Florida and the South Carolina and all the regions that were affected by that and the Caribbean islands. And keep in prayer Haiti. It's in a lot of distress. It's really got problems. I read it last week or a week and a half ago, we sent 3,300 troops there and all the banks are closed, all the Western unions are closed, all the markets are closed. You're not allowed to leave your house more than a mile if you, during the daylight hours and then you're within at night. Availability of food is not good and all the missionaries are basically getting out. Um, our Kathy and Alice and all the missionaries, MFI has been flying missionaries out the last couple of weeks constantly getting them out of Haiti um, because it's in such distress. So God knows, God knows what the solution is and pray for the nation of Haiti. And we'll see what he has in mind. Okay, Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 to 23. This morning the world is World Communion Sunday, and there's a lot to go with that. Communion is sharing participation in something, fellowship, unity, agreement, because you have something in common. And it comes from this passage. Well, this is one of the passages that deal with it. In verse 19, Paul was writing to the Colossians, and he says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. As you look at the importance of the gospel, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation. You've heard people say, I'm giving you the gospel truth. Well, it is the facts. And there is other Gospels out there, but the true Gospel is the fact that Jesus shed his life on the cross and shed his blood so that we could have forgiveness. And when we receive that gift of forgiveness and the eternal life that goes with it, we become part of the body of Christ, as Dave mentioned in his prayers. But as we celebrate this world communion, the believers were having... Uh, some difficulties in the early church understanding what that reconciliation meant. They were not familiar with the grace aspect and they were more familiar with the sacrificial system that was in play. But Jesus became that one-time perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, that was provided for our, our forgiveness of sin. So as believers and followers in Christ, we have something in common with people all around the world. You don't have to know their language, you don't have to understand their cultures and customs, but you can know that you are something in common as Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior. And it ought to be our desire to seek Him first and let Him be the priority of our life. I think of Matthew 6, where Jesus has given the, the sermons on the mountain. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I would like us to cross-reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you will take a moment and turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 has a phrase in there that I just couldn't get away from as I was studying. And the phrase, you'll see, you'll see it in a moment. 1 Corinthians 10. You've probably seen it already. It's in the bulletin. And we're looking at verses 16 and 17. Well, let's start at 14. They had a problem in the Corinthian church with priorities, and they were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were abusing the gifts of the Spirit. They were abusing their liberties in Christ. And he gives them these admonitions. 
Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Anything that supersedes Christ in your life is idolatry. And anything taken in excess is out of bounds. That's very clear through the scriptures that there's a balance in life. But they were being abusive to certain things and he reprimands them there. I, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. There's a phrase coming, the cup of blessing. Are we not drinking from that cup? We are so blessed. The blessing cup in your life should be so full that you're drinking from the saucer. It overflowed as David. You know, my cup runneth over. And you know, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, were one bread, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. If you have received that bread of life, the Lord Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, that is the blessing. The cup of blessing is what he did and paid the price for our redemption. We are blessed that we are placed into his family. And as in Colossians referred to that we are presented to him, he wants us to be presented holy and blameless and above reproach. But the phrase that thinks that we were reconciled, so you could use the phrase, pardon me. And if you're a Christian, you have been pardoned. You have been released from the penalty of your sins, set free. And when you're set free, and you know, even in the court of laws, you can't be judged twice for the same situation. It's this holiday. It's a done deal. You're let free. So as believers in Christ, we have this cup of blessing, which we are blessed with, and we are given this bread of life that we can share to a hungry world, and the, the blood of Christ that can forgive any sin, there is hope that can be in him. And as we sang, the peace that was available through Christ. So in Colossians 1, as you look at world communion, I want to bring out the fact about Christ, and then why did he go through what he did? When Jesus came, he came as the perfect son. And it says in verse 19 that it pleased the Father that in him, all the fullness should dwell. Who's he talking about the in him? In the Lord Jesus. It pleased the Father that Jesus would be all sufficient. What does that mean? All I know is that was the humanity and deity of Christ all in one unit. He was 100% God and 100% man all at the same time. And I can't explain it to where you can fully understand it because he could be man and he could be God all at the same time. He, could, he had human needs and human desires and things that would come with human, not evil, because he was not, never sinned in any thought, deed, or word, or nothing. He was sinless, the perfect Lamb of God. But he also was divine because he was demonstrate he knew people's thoughts and he performed miracles. He was all God and all man at the same time. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, says John. So he was the perfect son, and it pleased the father to do that. The father has that capability because he is sovereign God. He not only gave Jesus the responsibility to provide the redemptive plan, but he also gave him another job, and we're going to see that he pr promoted him as judge. He appointed him to judge the nations. He will be the righteous judge given the responsibility to judge the world at the end of time. And there'll be two judgments, and you can read about those in, in Corinthians, the Bema Seat, or the Judgment Seat of Christ for believers. In Revelation, the Great White Throne for those that are unbelievers. And I will tell you that if you stand before Christ at the Bema Seat, you will not be in judged for your sin because that was taken care of. You're being judged, or you're giving account of what you've done with the gifts and the talents and the times and the possessions that he entrusted to you as stewards and as you work in his kingdom. It is not a, a condemnation hearing. The great white throne is that. If you have to stand there, you were an unbeliever and you will have no excuse and no reason to escape that eternal condemnation promised to those that have not received him. So you have the righteous judge, you have the spotless Lamb of God, 
And the emphasis today is on that, that he was the perfect sacrifice. And he willingly followed the Father's plan. And he counted it all joy when he was smitten and stricken and in, endured the cross so that we could be restored to fellowship with the Father through his shed blood. And that's what we're coming to in a few moments to the communion table. That communion table has no power to save you. That is an element, a representation of what Jesus did for you. The power of saving comes through faith and trust in him. That amazing grace. There is no divine, it is a, it, yeah, it's a commanded ordinance. And it's something we ought to do as believers, but it's a reminder of what he did for us. And it has no cleansing power, but it has an obedience. It says to not forsake yourself to that and to do often in remembrance of him. Not to forget the way that it changed your life. And not to forget the importance it is to take to every creature under heaven, as Paul alluded to. We have a responsibility as believers to share the bread of life to others and to share the saving grace of Christ to the world in which we live. That is our duty. So he is our righteous judge. That is the what of the situation. The why. Why did he do all that? In verse 22 and 23, he tells us those things. He had submits his plan. In verse 22, in the body of his flesh, through death, what did he want to do? To present us holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Holy simply means that you're set apart for a specific use. These communion wear plates and that thing on the cover that it's seated on, what if that's the right word, are set aside for that purpose. We don't use those plates for anything else. We don't use that tablecloth for anything else. It's set aside for a specific purpose. Well, you know what? We are set aside as individuals for a specific purpose. He saves us with a reason in mind. He wants us to accomplish certain things in the world where he places us, in the dynamics where we are, to make a difference for his kingdom. We are the body of Christ. We, are to be, we can't all be doing the same thing. If we were all pastors of this church, you know what it would sound like right now? And if we were all living, you know, if you were all in the same, it would be, you are given responsibilities, you, are give, you were equipped for what he wants you to do for a specific purpose. Holy involves that, set apart for a specific use. And then you have the next word that he present, that we be presented blameless. So you need to realize that God has something for you to be doing. And if you aren't doing it, well, get with it. Just get busy and do what he wants you to do. So you are set apart, then you're to be blameless. That comes down to our act of our will. To do what is right because it is right. We live in a world where we can get away with about anything. If you, if you can't get away with it, you hire the best attorney and he can get you out of it. Or, what, you know, that kind of thing. But no, it shouldn't be that way. We should be blameless without, when the accusations aren't correct that people will hurl at you. Whenever you do things that are right because it is right, when the, the, the good report is given, the reputation that you have amongst your peers and in your community, blameless is where they don't have any reason to cast judgment or, oh, if that's a Christian, I don't need to be one of those, or I'm better than, you know, comparison standard. So you have a blameless presentation. And on top of that, above reproach, that's going the extra mile. That's being sure that you don't offend someone and making sure that you use proper ethics and things that are required. That is a good Christian testimony, that you can demonstrate love and grace and compassion and kindness only through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not our, of ourselves. It is a str the strength that is within so we have Jesus described as the perfect son, the spotless lamb, and the righteous judge so that we could be blameless and holy and above reproach in the world in which we live. You need to be able to make a difference. Like the little song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, making a light in a dark world. And believe me, the darker the world, the brighter the light will become. 
And light has a uniqueness. It dispels darkness. You can, no matter how dark it is, you can see a faintest light. If you had this room pitch black, you could strike a match and everyone in the room could see it. That's just how important sharing the light is. The light of Christ can dispel the darkness that is in the world. If we want to change the world, then let's get the good news of the gospel out. And as the hearts are changed, it'll make a difference. And it's just how that works. So you have the plan submitted to present us holy, blameless, and above reproach. But it comes down to the personal decision, and that's in verse 23. That two-letter word that starts off the verse, if. Is that not a condition? If. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. He lists three things that you need to consider. One, that you continue in the faith. Not only do you stay with what you believe, there's an even stronger attachment to that, that you are grounded and steadfast. If you are grounded, you, it is secure. I think of this hurricane that went through Florida. I lived in Florida four years through Bible college. There are a lot of palm trees in Florida, if you ever visited that. And you can be going down the expressway, and there comes a tractor trailer with two or three palm trees on the trailer part of the unit. You can't do that with an oak tree. What's the big difference? The root system. And you know what? When the hurricane winds come, and that palm tree has a root base no bigger than that table. What do you think is going to happen? There it is. I've seen them go over. We went through a few of those in the four years I was down there. Well, there's the palm tree. They'll put another one in tomorrow. Don't worry about it. They'll dig, put, that's what will happen. And that's basically, but the oak tree, it, if it, it most likely will withstand it because the root system, it's grounded. And you know what? Christians are going to make it. Those that are, they're going to all, let me, let me clarify that. If you're a Christian, you're going to make it to heaven. That's promised by his redemption. You're going to make it through the storms of this life and survive it if you're grounded in his word. And believe me, in the culture we're in, you better be grounded in his word. Because it's hard to discern between the truth and the error. And it's hard to discern what in the world does God want me to do. Well, you can get it from his word. His word never changed, and it will endure to all generations, so don't think it's something new. If you think situations that we're facing now are really just brand new, no, just read the Bible. Did they have a problem with identity of who they were in the, the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah? Did they have problems with powers that were corrupt politically in the Bible? Absolutely. There's basically no new problems. They've just taken on different dimensions and intensified some in some places. But his word can still sustain and it still changes lives and it still can guide us in paths of righteousness. So that we need to be grounded and steadfast. Know what you believe and don't budge. That's the way it is. If it's right and the Holy Spirit of God has confirmed it, it's right. Done deal. You don't have to change your mind with popular opinion. You don't have to be influenced by the majority crowd or techniques or threats or none of that kind of stuff. Do you think the three Hebrew children were afraid of the threat? If they were human, they thought about it, but they knew their God was bigger than that. That God was able, well, nevertheless, King, if, he does, if God doesn't spare us, we're still not going to bow down to you. You know, they were willing to pay the price because of what they believed in. And we're going to maybe be called to that. And in your bulletin, it deals with the persecuted church where people are paying the price because of what they believe in. Are they sorry they're doing it? No. The church that is persecuted is growing fast. And it is growing quick. In China, the persecuted church is phenomenally big. And that's encouraging to me. You cannot squelch the work of God. He supersedes all the powers that are here. So he wants us to be grounded in our faith, the faith and trust we have in him. 
strong and unmovable. The second thing is that we be confident. Confident of what? Of the hope of the gospel. If that word hope was in Sunday school class that we had, that is a done deal. As believers in Christ, you are as sure to heaven as being there. You just aren't there yet. You're in this pilgrimage, this journey, being confident of that hope. With the hope of the gospel, first of all, in that confidence, you know that you have received it. Everyone seated in this room and everyone that hears this message knows if they are a believer of Christ or not. You know that. Because when you put your faith and trust in Him, the Holy Spirit of God comes within and He is your guarantee and He is the one that gives you that assurance of eternal life. And there's nobody that can shake you from that unless you don't believe or understand His Word because He promises that gift of eternal life. And when you have received it, then you ought to be appreciative of it, being grateful. I think of the song, I'm Forever Grateful, and we ought to be that. And lastly, not only should we know that we've received it and appreciate it, we should be willing to share it. Because that is how the unsaved will become believers in Christ. If we don't tell them, who will? I'm to assure you, the news media will not tell them. And I can assure you, the world and the devil wants to keep them from it. The devil has blinded their eyes, so we as witnesses and testimonies of our Lord and Savior need to shine a light so they can see the truth and have an opportunity to receive it. So as believers, we're given responsibility. Not only are we given an assurance, there is an accountability that we have given to us because of the hope of the gospel. As we have world communion, think of those that might not be as fortunate as us. Those that are afraid to carry their Bible because of incarceration. Those that cannot name the name of Christ or they become under a death warrant. Those that are persecuted, they're still in the body of Christ. And we have an obligation to pray for them. And those that aren't within the body of Christ, we have a, a responsibility to share the truth with them so they too can receive. Heavenly Father, as we've Look at your word. Help us to know in our hearts that we have been reconciled and have had our sins forgiven. And with that, show our gratitude. And by showing our gratitude, we demonstrate love and share this truth with others. Help us to be testimonies of your grace and love to this world that is in darkness and without hope. Thank you, God, for allowing Jesus to pay the price for our sins so that we can have that eternal life. And not only that, we can have a wonderful life here because we have that eternal hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.